Hello and welcome. I'm Rebecca Wright, Professor of Computer Science and Faculty Director of the Vagilos Computational Science Center, or CSC. It is a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Barnard and the CSC to this event, which kicks off our new speaker series on diversity in computing. In addition to this series, the CSC holds open workshops every other Friday where people can come to learn computing skills, see how um, computing is useful across all disciplines, and become part of a community of people interested in computation and its applications. In the CSC's Computing Fellows Program, we have a new cohort uh, this year of un uh, 11 undergraduate fellows who work with classes across the curriculum to include meaningful computing activities and experiences in those classes, including an organic chemistry lab, introduction to neuroscience, a first year seminar on technology and society, and an education policy class. Uh, we at the CSC are committed to promoting the use of computing in and beyond the sciences while lowering the barrier of entry and raising the level of awareness and excitement. I'll turn over in a minute to the center's associate director, Saima Akhtar, to introduce the series and our speaker, uh, Theodore Kim, who we are very excited to have with us today. Dr. Akhtar joined Barnard in June, and she brings her own multidisciplinary perspective and experiences to the CSC. She comes to us most recently from Yale University, where she was a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Computer Science and managed cultural heritage, uh, cultural heritage preservation projects between the fields of computer science and architecture. She is already expanding the reach of the CSC with new activities and new collaborations, and we are thrilled to have her. Dr. Akhtar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, so as part of the Year of Science at Barnard College, the Vagilos Computational Science Center is excited to launch our Diversity in Computing Speaker Series with Dr. Theodore Kim. This series will run for the entire academic year and will feature talks from scholars and practitioners in computational fields who will explore what DEI means and looks like in STEM. The series emerges at, out of an urgent need to more fully consider the ethical and social implications of computing and its applications. For example, in designing addictive social media platforms or in using AI for facial or name recognition, which can lead to housing discrimination, racial biases and job hiring, or restrictions on personal freedoms through public and private surveillance. To better understand how to counter these biases, this series reimagines STEM disciplines from the inside out. We invite one leader in a STEM field every month to speak about the work they are doing to diversify and broaden inclusion in their fields by either sharing their research and experiences or their thoughts on how power structures within computing disciplines should be transformed to create more equitable systems. And with that, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Kim, who is an associate professor in computer science at Yale University, where he investigates biomechanical solids, fluid dynamics, and selected topics in geometry. Previously, he was a senior research scientist at Pixar Animation Studios. He is the recipient of the NSF Career Award, multiple Best Paper Awards, and a Scientific and Technical Academy Award. His algorithms have appeared in over 20 films, and he has screen credits for Cars 3, Coco, Incredibles 2, and Toy Story 4. His first uncredited work appeared on screen on The Sorting Hat in Harry Potter and Sorcerer's Stone. Dr. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Akhtar. All right, so this will be the awkward moment where I try to bring my slides up, and then I have to activate it in Zoom. So everyone bear with me for a second, please. Okay, can everyone see the slide okay? Yes. Okay, great, thank you so much. All right, good evening everyone, and thanks for coming to my talk, Anti-Racist Graphics Research. Um, so there's actually gonna be a lot of pictures in this talk, but before we get to that, uh, I wanna get a few concepts down. All right, so we're gonna get right to it. Uh, computer graphics research has a race problem. Now, there's lots of dimensions to this problem, and the one that you usually hear about is about how hiring and promotion uh, is not equitable. So that is a big problem. Uh, it would be a mistake to think that that is the whole picture, though. So I'm going to talk about how it's actually a problem in research, so I'm not going to talk about those other versions. So instead, what I'm going to talk about is that our basic scientific formulations in computer graphics have insidious biases built into them. So this is a very uncomfortable and disturbing version 
of bias because many of us are used to thinking of math as math and physics as physics. And we kind of resist the idea that science contains any bias. And in fact, this is what attracted many of us to the sciences to begin with. We get to look at these clean neutral problems all day and we don't have to deal with all the ugly politics of the real world. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like you can escape this. So um, the term systemic racism has appeared a lot lately. And the point of systemic racism is that historically racist assumptions have been baked into many of our everyday institutions, whether we like it or not. And science is not an exception to this. And in particular computer graphics, which I work in, it is not an exception to this. So you may have heard the term unconscious bias before, and this is intimately connected. So if we don't consciously think about the racial implications of our work, we're just gonna end up reproducing all the existing inequalities that exist in the systems that surround us. Now, if we don't believe that these biases and these inequalities reflect the world that we want to live in, then we have to take deliberate and concrete steps that counter this bias. And that is the anti-racist part of my title. So we're gonna recognize the pull of historical inertia and we're gonna take, we're gonna make the deliberate decision to step in the other direction. Okay, oh, I promised you pictures. Uh, that was a quick text only outline of this entire talk. Let's look at each of the components that I mentioned in order. All right, first, racial bias in research. Bias in science? What is he talking about? Math is just math, right? Well, only up to a point. So how do we formulate the research problems that we decide to work on? How does this problem formulation then influence the solution? And how does the math then come to encode these assumptions? Um, from this perspective, hopefully I'll be able to convince you that yes, this bias is real. And hopefully once I've convinced you of that, the next question will be, well, then where did it come from? Has there been some evil secret society of racists working in the field of computer graphics? Uh, if that were the case, then the solution would be easy, right? We would just cast out the racists. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. So where did it actually come from? And the last piece is once we have an understanding of the first two pieces, what do we do about it now? All right, so let's get to the first part racial bias and research. So I'm gonna start with a seemingly basic question. What is human skin? More specifically, in computer graphics research, when we talk about human skin, what are we really talking about? So there's a bunch of different ways that you can look at this, and we're gonna look at it from several different directions. Um, the way that I'm gonna look at it first though is uh, the way that usually has the most impact in, in computer graphics. So uh, in computer graphics, um, something has a lot of impact when you know, there's a university researcher does some really interesting research. It then gets uh, um, used by Hollywood to make a Hollywood film. And from there, the science, it just spills over into popular culture. All right, so let's try that. So here's a paper from our top conference, SIGGRAPH. This is 20 years ago, 20 years old, 2001. This is Jensen et al.'s A Practical Model for Subsurface Light Transport from SIGGRAPH 2001. Uh, so both of these images on top and bottom, these are synthetic humans. So back 20 years ago, what they were trying to do is get more realistic looking computer generated humans. So this was a blockbuster paper when it was first published. So as of today, there's like over 1100 citations on Google Scholar for this paper, which for computer graphics, that's a lot of citations. So, uh, the reason for this popularity is that it's one of the first papers ever to show how to get subsurface scattering right. And if you get subsurface scattering right, you get a much more realistic looking human face. Now, it wasn't the first paper to try this. For example, there was a paper by Hanrahan and Kruger that I tried previously, but it was the first algorithm for computing this phenomena that experienced widespread commercial success. All right, so what is subsurface scattering? So, um, if you haven't taken a computer graphics course, or maybe you took it a long time ago, um, well, maybe we should go over a little bit of nuts and bolts here, all right? So uh, one of the first things you usually learn in a computer graphics class is how to create a synthetic image of uh, a scene containing lots of hard surfaces, all right? Uh, this is a very classic algorithm, it's called ray tracing. So um, what you can do is you see that there's this light source in the upper left here, it shoots out light rays, right? So those light rays, they hit an object, you can see it in the gray half plane at the bottom here and it bounces off that object at the exact same location that it hit. 
and it does a few bounces. And then if it bounces into your eye or if it hits a piece of like virtual film that you have in the scene, then uh, you start to get an image. Right? So uh, this model is pretty good at representing hard, shiny surfaces like metals. So uh, we can go way back like then to, to the 80s. And we can see that if we have this assumption that the ray bounces off at the exact same location as it hit, um, you can get this. This is like a copper pot, right? Yeah, and it's an, it's an 80s photo, so it's a little grainy. But yeah, it looks like a copper pot. It does a pretty good job. All right, subsurface scattering, the topic that this paper dealt with, it is subtly different. So light gets emitted again from the light source on the upper left, as you can see. But what happens is when that light ray hits an object, it actually penetrates the medium slightly. All right, so uh, this, this happens for lots of materials out there. So milk or soap or skin, uh, what happens is it penetrates into the medium, it bounces around a few times, and then it exits the medium again, but the location is slightly different from the location that initially hit. All right, so uh, what, what effect that this has is that uh, the light ray, it spreads out a little in space, all right? So it gives all objects a softer look, People say that it gives it a certain glow. All right, so this is the skin glow that you see in many famous paintings. So like you see these Vermeer paintings and people say the same thing, right? It's like, yeah, the girl with the pearl earring, she has a certain glow. All right, now we get to the difficult part. So it is true that all skin does this to some extent, but it is the most important feature in white skin. So here's a Britney Spears ad from around the time that paper was published. And you can see, yeah, she has a glow, right? There's a lot of subsurface scattering happening on her face. Uh, same thing on the right, this is a Vogue cover from 2001. This is Giselle Bündchen. And you can see, yes, she has a glow to her, like a Vermeer painting. Uh, yeah, there's lots of subsurface scattering in her face. What about black skin though? All right, so here's a shot of uh, the actor Delroy Lindo from uh, a movie from the same era. This is Spike Lee's movie, Clockers. So um, we can look at the, the, the white highlights on his brow and along his nasolabial folds. And the thing is, subsurface scattering is not the dominant light transport mode here. It's not like this Vermeer-like glow that is actually giving his face all of its character. It's the shine. So this is a separate light transport mode. Um, this is called specular reflection. So it is not the subsurface scattering that gives Delroy Lindo his very characteristic face. It is his shine, all right? So for black skin, subsurface scattering is dramatically less important. But if you were working in graphics in 2001, which I was, it's actually really easy to remember everyone snapping up this subsurface scattering technique as the technique for skin. Uh, so back in 2001, uh, virtual humans and movies they looked pretty terrible, all right? So uh, there's this movie, um, you probably don't remember it. It was called Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. So this is the main character from the film. This is one of the glamor shots when she is first introduced. And you can see, she looks terrible. She has all of the Uncanny Valley stuff going on. Her skin looks all hard and plasticine. And yeah, it tanked at the box office, which is probably why you've never heard of it. So the next year, uh, this movie came out which uh, you probably have heard of, right? So Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, that came out next year. It, it actually won the Oscar for Best Special Effects and it even got nominated for Best Picture. And I would argue that the enduring image from that movie is Gollum. So he is whiter than white. He is a subterranean being that has not seen the sun in years and years. And, excuse me, the director, Peter Jackson, he knew he had to get this fish belly translucency um, of Gollum's skin just right. And he did get it just right because Weta Digital, the visual effects studio that did Gollum, it snapped up the algorithm from that 2001 paper right when it came out and it applied it to Gollum. So you're not gonna find anybody whiter or more translucent than Gollum. So as I said, I was actually working in the industry at this time. So uh, I was working at Rhythm and Hue Studios in 2001, even before the Two Towers came out, as soon as this paper was posted, Everybody wanted it, including my bosses at Rhythm and Use Studios. Um, so they were currently bidding at that time on a James Cameron film that was since canceled called Brother Termite. It was a super secret project, uh, but it involved humans. And they knew that if they wanted to be competitive while bidding for this movie, they had to have this new technique. 
All right, so in graphics, when we're talking about skin, we're talking about subsurface scattering. But that's only the dominant visual component of white skin. So when we talk about skin and graphics, we're actually talking about white skin. OK, so we can actually see this pattern in the technical literature if we just start crawling forward in time um, from this Jensen paper. So here's the caption to that image that I showed earlier. So it's labeled as a face and skin. It doesn't say white face. It doesn't say white skin. It says face and skin. So let's look at the papers that come after this and see how the language rolls forward from here. All right, here's a paper from the same year, rendering skin. Here's a paper from the next year, a skin shader. This is actually Princess Fiona from Shrek 2. A 2005 paper dealing with human skin. We see the term again in 2007, and it's even in the title of the paper, human skin. All right, 2008 again, human skin. Again, it's even in the title. 2010, here's a paper on skin appearance. 2011, here is a human face. 2013, here is human skin. 2015, skin. 2017, skin. And this is just from last year, right? So a paper on skin in 2020. All right, so we come back to the same point. When we talk about skin in computer graphics, we're talking about white skin. So you can go back and look at all of these papers if you want to. Uh, you'll see I didn't cherry pick like just the one white image from those papers. There are no renderings of black or brown people in any of these papers. There are only images of white people. Now there are some papers that try to hit different skin tones. So there's this one from 2006. So great, good for them. And here's another one from that same year. So once again, it's great. You know, other people have tried to do something that's other than white skin. Uh, unfortunately, you search around and it, it quickly becomes clear that these are the exceptions. These are not the rule. So in graphics, when we talk about skin, uh, we are overwhelmingly talking about white skin. Maybe not 100% exclusively, but overwhelmingly, we mean white skin. All right, we can examine this problem from a different perspective. Uh, so Professor Sophia Noble at UCLA, she is one of the leading scholars of bias in technology. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna borrow an idea from uh, from her book, Algorithms of Repression. So in that book, uh, she says, well, if you just like look at what Google hands back to you when you search for certain things, it tells you a lot. All right, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna do a Google image search for the term skin shader. This is a different way to measure what do we mean when we say skin in computer graphics, right? So shader, this is, uh, this is computer lingo for graphics program. All right, this is the first page of hits for skin shader. You can see they're all CGI um, and they're all white. All right, here's the second page. I put in skin shader, I didn't say white skin shader. Here's the next page. Oh, hey, there's one black guy, that's great. Okay, maybe it's the start of a pattern. Here's the next page. Here's the next page. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. Uh, you, you can do this yourself. You can keep scrolling. And um, I, I think you'll find just the one picture of that black guy. All right, so once again, when we talk about skin in graphics, we're talking about white skin. And when we're talking about white skin, we're talking about subsurface scattering. And the thing is, this has now been codified into the math. So we can write it down as a double integral. We can isolate the BSS RDF term, the subsurface scattering term, and we can start, start developing some numerical methods for it. And at this point, something very dangerous happens. So it looks like we've used, uh, uh, we've rigorously isolated the physics of skin appearance, right, in some mathematical physics sense. So we've wrapped it in a double integral, and it's a big scary equation now, right? This is essentially set in stone now. So now, because it, there's a double integral associated with it, unless you're a member of an extremely small specialist community that specializes in this equation, you do not have the standing to dispute that maybe this isn't skin. But we just went through it, right? What really happened here is the one piece of physics that's the most important to white skin was carved out and codified as skin. It's not all skin. 
So what we're actually trying to do here is we're trying to emulate the types of skin that dominated the ads and magazines in the late 90s. OK, we can look at this from a third direction, which is uh, commercial software. Right. So I can't take credit for this approach. Uh, this is my brilliant colleague, Professor Rocky Syed at Victoria University in Wellington. She suggested this. She says she said, look at the documentation for the software out there. All right, here is the skin tutorial from a very popular renderer. It's, it's been used uh, to you know, render like all your all your favorite Marvel movies, and stuff, for example. This is called the Arnold renderer. So up until recently, uh, this was the tutorial for the skin shader. And you can see it's all geared towards one type of skin. All right, here is Pixar, my former employer. Uh, this is the documentation for their skin shader. So this is the only picture of a human anywhere in the documentation. There's not another one if you scroll down. So yeah, what kind of humans are we talking about when we talk about skin? And here's another popular renderer called Redshift. Um, again, it's quite clear what they mean when they say the word skin. You see this picture of this one guy uh, on the front page. And actually, this is a really long documentation. I scrolled downwards, and there's 63 images, all of this one white guy. Not a single other human being of a different skin shade is in this page. 63 times over and over, just this guy. All right, and the first renderer I showed Arnold, they actually have a gallery of results from users uh, that have generated uh, some uh, humans that they've generated using their software. And you can see the gallery here. So you can see what the, uh, the users are using it for, right? And you can see uh, who this technology was designed for. All right, so now we've seen three instances of skin equals white skin. So first in the technical papers of our peer reviewed conferences and journals, Second, uh, a more popular understanding of it uh, as cataloged by Google. And third, a commercial understanding of it as evidenced by the documentation of widely used renderers. So at this point, I hope that I've convinced you that this bias does exist. So there's more to explore here, um, but I'm going to leave that to the next section because skin is not the only time that this has happened. All right, so we're still on the first part, what racial bias, but we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, it's not all about skin. Everything I just talked about, uh, it happened with hair too. All right, so what is human hair? Let's do it all again. In computer graphics, when we say human hair, what are we really talking about? So we can go way back. So this is a paper from Ken Angio's group over in Japan back in 92. So straight black hair. So that's one type of hair. But there's lots of different hair types out there, right? There's even a type system for this. There's a really popular one among stylists uh, called the Walker system. You can see it here. And you can see that uh, that straight black hair that we just saw, this is type one, right? Super straight and, front and fine. All right, you can go all the way down to four. There's actually even more than this. So it's called 4C hair. And uh, that would be on the other side of the scale. So what does 4C hair look like? All right, it looks like this. It's super, super, super curly. Um, so people call this Afro textured hair or kinky hair or coiled hair. Um, and it's, it's most common in black people. All right, so let's do it again. Let's go through the graphics literature. Um, what kind of hair are we gonna see? All right, here's a paper from 2001. This is hair. 2002, this is hair. 2003, this is human hair. 2005, hair. 2008, hair, 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 we're up to 2014 now, hair. All right, now we're all the way up to last year. So this is a, this is a paper from Weta Digital, the people that did Gollum, um, and you can see this is hair. All right, so again, you see the same trend. This is hair. Uh, mostly type one, you can see some type two a little bit, um, nothing approaching type four, right? Um, the, the woman with the, uh, with the kinky hair, there's nothing like that here. And again, let's go back to the Britney Spears and sell bunch of ads. So again, uh, when we're talking about hair and computer graphics research, we're kind of just trying to reproduce these ads from the 90s. So, um, 
I did dig around and there are some instances of type four hair looking stuff ending up in technical collocations. But this is very interesting. When it does, it's not actually recognized as hair. So here's a paper from 2017. Hey, look at that ball of stuff at the top there. That's pretty close to type four hair, right? But look at the caption. It doesn't say hair, it says fibrous material. And the weird thing is, is that uh, hair doesn't make a, an appearance later on in this paper. So here is uh, uh, two tubes of hair that are being collided against each other. And you can see it in the caption, hair. And the even weirder thing is, you look at these two things side by side, these are both like actually super abstract, just like uh, you know nerdy um, uh, benchmarks that we cooked up, right? So neither of these could actually be mistaken as human hair, like on a human head. And yet, even in this abstract sense, this is hair. This is not hair. It just, it's not in our technical language. All right, so in our technical vocabulary, hair definitely does not mean type four hair, even when something very similar shows up in the publications. So when we talk about hair, we mean straight hair. So that's characteristic of Europeans and East Asians, like, like my hair. So even curly hair doesn't get a free pass. If you, wanna, if you want people to know you're talking about curly hair, you have to say it, curly hair. So it's impl implicitly, it's understood. When I say hair, I mean straight hair. So this is a phenomenon that was pointed out my, uh, by my brilliant colleague, Professor A.M. Dark at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, what we're seeing here, this is a very specific form of bias. Uh, this is called anti-blackness. So the point here is actually a, a little bit different from the skin example. So the point is not that we're favoring white features, it's that we're explicitly avoiding black features. Black features bad, doesn't count as human, doesn't count as hair. That's what we're seeing here. Okay, again, let's borrow a page from Professor Noble's methodology. Let's Google hair shader this time. Again, shader means graphics program. All right, this is super straight hair, right? Let's keep going. What's the next page of hits? Here it is. Let's keep going. All right, last time we got lucky, there was at least the one black eye, right? Are we gonna get lucky this time? Keep going, keep going. And uh, I'm sorry to report that. I, I actually scrolled for a really long time. Uh, there is no type four. There's no type four example. I couldn't find a single one. All right, again, let's use the idea from my colleague, uh, Professor um, uh, Rocky Syed. All right, let's look at the commercial software. All right, here's the, air, here's the hair uh, documentation from Arnold, straight hair. Here it is from Pixar, it's all straight hair. Here it is from Redshift, again, all straight hair. All right, and let's look at that Arnold feature gallery again, uh, the, the gallery of, uh, look at all the great stuff that our users generated. All straight hair, right? No type four hair. So who was this software actually designed for? All right, so in graphics, when we talk about skin, we're talking about white skin. And when we talk about hair, we mean everything except for black hair. All right, where did this come from? Was there some evil cabal of researchers at the very beginning of graphics who said, we're gonna just focus on the features of white people? So again, the answer here is no, because that would be too easy. We could just say, all right, we're gonna expel the racists and we'll just think a little bit harder in the future, we'll be more inclusive from now on. It's not gonna be that easy. Um, so we live in a world shaped by history and actually everything I just showed you, this has all happened before. So all these patterns you see, these actually predate computer graphics. Um, so it actually, it, it already happened again uh, once before us in uh, analog film and analog photography. So we all entered um, when things went digital and we just did it all over again. All right, so the, this is cyclical. It's hard to know uh, where to start with this story, but let's start with the development of color film. Okay, so again, for non-specialists, we get math is math and physics is physics. And when you look at you know chemistry, you say the same thing. So chemistry is chemistry, right? So color film was developed in order to capture all the colors of the world, right? Well, here's a shot 
from Renoir's 1952 film, uh, The Golden Coach. So this was shot in Technicolor. Uh, so just to be clear, this is Renoir, the famous filmmaker. He is the son of Renoir, the famous painter. This is not Renoir, the famous painter. This is his son. All right. So look at the difference between the white actor and the black actor. You can't even see the black actor's eyes or his teeth. Is he like in shadow? He's not. All right. Here's another shot from that same movie. Uh, look at the middle. There's a small child offering treats to a white audience that is watching a play. You can't see his face at all. I think this is astonishing. So if I went in and I just photoshopped his face out and just replaced it with all black, I don't think it would look that different. So what's going on here? Now, the thing is, uh, the entire color film process, this is calibrated to capture, quote unquote, skin tones. So which skin tones are we actually talking about? All right, so to understand this a little bit better, um, we can look at the concept of leader ladies. These are also known as China girls. Um, so I have to give a big uh, shout out to my esteemed colleague, Claudia Davis. Uh, she's the one who actually introduced me to this repository that I'm gonna show you here. Um, this is a repository from the, the Chicago Film Project dealing with this concept. All right, so the analog film development process, it was literally, literally calibrated to capture the appearance of white skin. So what is a leader lady? Uh, this was a few frames of a white woman that was taped to the front of uh, a piece of film. And, uh, okay, so the, the Chicago Film Society, they've compiled all of these uh, few frames that they could find. Um, what would happen is the technician in the lab, they would know that the, the chemical balance in whatever de development bath that they have is correct. Um, when the skin tones in the white lady um, that they had taped to the front of the film uh, started showing up correctly, right? So they literally calibrated it to, uh, to make sure that a white woman looked, looked correct um, when they calibrated all our chemistry. All right, so uh, we can see it in all of these examples of leader ladies, right? Um, actually, if you look at the bottom left here, there is one Asian lady. So we're kind of in the same boat as that Google image search. Okay, yeah, we got the one exception. So it's not 100% white skin, but it's pretty overwhelmingly white skin. So even in the analog era, they did the same thing, right? They said, yeah, so uh, we, we're gonna design the chemistry for flesh tones. What do you mean by flesh tones? Uh, they meant white skin. So I find the historical echo here to be striking. So here is the tableau of leader ladies compiled by the Chicago Film Society on the left. And here is the tableau of human faces from the Arnold renderer on the right. This is systemic racism. It's baked right into the history of our medium. So we didn't know about these biases when we went around uh, uh, developing, these al developing these algorithms. So what did we do? We just unconsciously reproduced all of the biases of, of past eras. So there's a lot more to the history here. So in particular, there's one piece that I really haven't done justice to, and that is there's a big gender component to this. Why is it always a leader lady? Why was it always a woman? So if you're interested in this history, there's a really great book out there uh, called Girlhead uh, by, by Professor Genevieve Yu. So I highly recommend it if you're interested in this topic. So we can go back to the golden coach here and you might say, well, if you lit the black actors differently and you fussed with the shutter speed on the camera, maybe they would show up just fine. So uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think you're correct. Okay, so definitely what's going on here is the chemistry of the film, that's not the only piece of technology at work here. There's tons of lighting, there's tons of costuming and makeup. And there's lots of stuff that goes into making a film, right? Um, more precisely, there's lots that goes into making sure that uh, certain preferred colors and brightness ranges show up in film, right? So let's look at lighting, for example, a different piece of technology that's being used in the filmmaking. So there's lots of manuals on movie lighting. This is one of the classics. This is uh, John Alton's Painting with Light from 1949. Now, I'm not just pulling this out of nowhere. Um, this is a very well-known text, even in the computer graphics community. Like people like cheekily like uh, title their papers painting with light or lighting with paint, that sort of thing. This is a very well-known text. So if you want to know how to light a face, you look at chapter five, the Hollywood close-up. All right, here we go again. All right, 
a human face. So same phenomena as before. The language, in fact, is exactly the same. He's talking about lighting a human face. And what does he mean when he says human face? Human face, human face, human face, human face. All right, uh, so you scroll through this chapter, you'll see a lot of, much of the same. So uh, when he said human face, he meant a white face, All right? Now you might say, we're looking at a book from the 40s. Things were different back then. Uh, yeah, it, that is fair. Okay, so um, he was using the standards of the 40s. Things were different back then. But we're living in 2021. We shouldn't be using the 1940 standards. Okay, so. In order to light a face, John Alton described an eight point lighting system. So he lists all the light here's, lights here. This is actually almost this, exactly the same system that we use today. So nowadays, if you crack open a book on film lighting, um, people use something called a three point lighting system. It, it's actually just three of the lights from Alton's uh, eight lights. So I don't think Alton invented this. I don't think he claims to invented, have invented this either. It is just, this was common practice back then and it is still common practice now. All right, so we inherited all of this into the digital age. So there's a lot of books on digital lighting, but I'm gonna go ahead and say this one is a very popular one. So Jeremy Burns, Digital Lighting and Rendering. This is where I learned it from, for example. So here's a figure from chapter five of the book. You can see three-point lighting system, just like I said. So you got your key light and let's look at Alton's list, key light. All right, check. You got your fill light. All right, fill light, check. And you got your rim light. Wait a minute, Alton calls it the backlight. So in modern language, it's called rim light. Why was it backlight back then? Why did this switch happen? Okay, so uh, Byrne actually describes this in his book. He said, okay, well, that was back in the black and white era when this stuff was named. The original intent of the backlight, especially in black and white film, was to separate the background from the foreground. So he especially calls attention to the top here. So uh, you can see that there's a highlight on the top of this apple. You can, you can see it, it is better separated from the background due to the presence of this light. That's why it's called the backlight, to separate it from the background. So why are people calling it a rim light now? Well, if you have a model with straight blonde hair, the rim light will give that model a glowing rim. That's why it's a rim light. It makes straight blonde hair glow. All right, let's look at that Giselle ad again. Her hair is really glowing, right? This is not a mistake. There is some major rim lighting going on in this shot. Now, I'm not just speculating here. Actually, even in the black and white era, Alton, he called this out. He said, all right, backlights, it's good for separating stuff from the background. You know what else it's good for? Blonde hair. It adds brilliance and life to the hair of blondes. And apparently over the last 70 years, there's been a lot of people who agreed because they don't even call it the backlight anymore. They call it the rim light. All right, so here we are again. In the analog era, when people talked about skin, they meant white skin. So we saw it in the film development benchmarks and we saw it in the images for a human face. And again, when we talked about hair, we definitely did not talk about type four hair. Didn't see it in the leader ladies. And yeah, you did not see it in the human faces. So we see the result of this here in the golden coach. You can barely see where the servant's hair even ends and his skin begins. So as far as the film technology is concerned, it was not designed for black skin and for kinky hair. All right, so that at least in part is where some of this racial bias came from. It's our inheritance from the analog era. So the wheel of history turned again, except this time we were the ones who turned it. What do we do now? This is the anti-racist part. So we recognize a problem and we see what happens when you just go with the flow and you don't think about it, right? You have to go against the flow. You have to do something that's just not a repeat of the same racist systems that existed before. So there's lots of ways to do this. And if you have an idea, especially if you're a tenured professor, you should do it. 
nobody in our society has more protection to try something than you do. So I'm going to propose something. I'm a tenured professor, so I might as well try it. So um, maybe this will actually sound really obvious, uh, but bear with me. OK, another one of the leading scholars on racial bias in technology is Professor Ruha Benjamin. This is particularly uh, one of her particularly famous books, so Race After Technology. So in that book, she talks about a very important concept called a Shirley card. All right, so what's a Shirley card? Uh, so actually, the core, the core scholarly publication on Shirley cards, this is actually by a, another professor named Lorna Roth. So I, I actually highly recommend reading this article and uh, uh, Dr. Benjamin's book because they're both really interesting. But anyway, what's a Shirley card? So this is actually the same concept as Leader Ladies, which we just saw, but it was for photo development. So like, you know, Kodak at your local photo hut back in the day. So Kodak started issuing these Shirley cards as development baselines in the 1950s, just like with Leader Ladies. So in the photo hut, you know, your chemical bath is off if you can't uh, see the skin tones here correctly. The story here is the same. Chemistry was calibrated to white skin, uh, but it changed actually in the 1990s. There's a really interesting article behind, uh, uh, or a story behind uh, why it diversified. It's actually in uh, Professor Roth's article. I, I, I won't try to seal any of her thunder. I, I really suggest that you read her article because it's really fascinating. Uh, the point is though, that it did start to diversify in the 90s. And this, this image actually is directly from Dr. Roth's article. And we should do this too, right? Computer graphics needs the equivalent of diversified Shirley cards, because right now, we only have this Shirley card, right? It's like we're stuck in the 1970s. So um, let's go back to that Google image search that I did for skin shader. Yeah, we're back we're stuck in like the 70s, right? So, well, not only are all these images, uh, images of white people, uh, they're actually this image of the same white person over and over. So look at these four. This is actually the same person, right? Uh, so what's going on here? Okay, so if we go back to even the pictures from the research papers that I showed you, yeah, it's that same guy, he shows up over and over. And we're gonna go to the Pixar render documentation. And hey, it's the same guy, who is this guy? So uh, this is a scan of the head of a guy named Lee Perry Smith. Uh, this scan was released back in the public domain, uh, to the public domain back in 2010. That This explains why everybody uses it. It's just that really high quality scan data, it's hard to come by. So we don't have a Shirley card in computer graphics, but we're doing something very similar. We're just rendering this guy's head over and over. All right, so there's one key difference here though. There's actually not a ground truth. So you look at it, you look at this, uh, this head across all these different papers, it looks totally different um, across them. So it's not quite doing what a benchmark is supposed to do. So we should come up with a benchmark. Right. And if you want something to catch on, usually it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good idea to come up with like a cool name for it. Uh, so we had Shirley cards for the thing that came before. Um, there, uh, Shirley was kind of, it was kind of being used as a pejorative. It was kind of like, yeah, some generic woman, um, that's generic woman actually, she's, she's been erased from history. We don't actually know who the original Shirley is. Uh, so I think it would be really beautiful if we turn this on its head. So in the 21st century version of this, we do the opposite. So uh, we name something after the scholars who did all the actual groundbreaking research on this topic. So if we come up with something uh, similar to this for computer graphics, let's call it like a Roth card or a U card, I think that would be really great. Um, I'm actually gonna, for the sake of argument, I'm gonna say Roth card here. Um, if you look at uh, Professor Roth's uh, chapter in this book, Captivating Technology, um, she talks about liberatory design principles and actually what we're doing right now by trying to build a benchmark. Uh, this is actually in line with some of the stuff she proposes. So I think Rothcard, that's, that's, that's a pretty good name. Okay, so first we need a complete Rothcard, even for the white skin case, because we don't even have that. So um, what measurements are needed of a human head in order to make it useful for research? And the answer is, I don't know. This is actually an open research problem. So in computer graphics, we've done this before. So back in the 90s, we had an, an architectural benchmark called the, um, the Cornell box. So we need, we need a new one now for Roth cards. Uh, so this is still an open research problem. How do you even you know, set the benchmark? 
Um, let's, let's try to have a little imagination here. Let's try to imagine that this problem has been solved and we actually have Roth cards that we can use to evaluate the quality of our renters, right? Let's imagine what we could do if we had these Roth cards in hand. All right, so if you're a gamer or you work in you know, computer graphics, you probably saw this thing that was announced earlier this year. So Epic, which is like the biggest game company in the entire world, they released a package called MetaHuman Creator. This is uh, Epic's software package for creating virtual humans for their games like Fortnite. You know, like I said, it's like the biggest game company in the world. Um, so they put a lot of um, money and resources behind this. They headhunted like people from the film industry. So there are people from Pixar and Industrial Light and Magic that helped out you know, putting this software package together. They spent millions of dollars on it. So for creating virtual humans. And if you look at the promotional materials, um, yeah, it actually does feature black men and women and all uh, they are included in the kinds of humans you can, that, that you can create with this tool. And let's be fair, look at the guy on the right, type four hair. Finally, finally, somebody did type four hair. That is awesome. All right, so really great, great brownie points for them. Let's uh, be a little bit more scientific though. So is this the last word on depicting humans? Is this software actually doing a good job? Well, uh, there's no benchmark to compare against. That's a problem. So instead we're kind of stuck, stuck with like, yeah, that looks fine, I guess. Let's imagine that we have Roth cards though. All right, so uh, in lieu of an actual Roth card, I'm just gonna show you screen grabs from uh, movies and we'll pretend that they're like fictional Roth cards. So here's Delroy Lindo from Clockers again. And this looks way off actually, right? So I said, yeah, so all the shiny uh, specularities on Delroy Lindo's face, this is what gives it all of its expressive character. And you look at the guy on the left and it's like, man, who deleted all the highlights? And not only that, but why is the pink kind of jacked up on the left-hand side? What is going on? All right, so maybe it's because Delroy Lindo's a little older. So here's Mickey Pfeiffer. He's also from the same movie. Um, he's the main character, actually. So you look at these two together, and this one, actually, actually, I think this does a pretty good job. All right, so uh, it does. A, if you were going to do a virtual Mickey Pfeiffer, yeah, yeah, MetaHuman would probably do a pretty good job. So is it that Mickey Pfeiffer is younger than Delroy Lindo? Well, there's a very young Isaiah Washington in that movie too. And we bring up him for comparison and no, it's not really there, right? Like half of his face is a highlight in this shot. So again, we look over on the left and we're like, who deleted all the highlights and why is the pink all jacked up? All right, so this is just one movie. This is Clockers. The cinematographer is Malik Syed. So maybe we're all just sort of overfitting to Malik Syed's sensibilities. Uh, this is a shot from Barry Jenkins's Moonlight, a totally different filmmaker, totally different cinematographer, best picture Oscar winner 2016. Same problem though. Who deleted all the highlights? Who jacked up all the pink in the subsurface? Uh, we can do the same thing for women. All right, so uh, here is Lupita Nyong'o from Ryan Coogler's Black Panther. Um, and we do a comparison. Again, who deleted all the highlights? Why is the pink all jacked up? Totally different filmmaker here. This is Viola Davis and Steve McQueen's Widows. Same problem. All right, so the point here actually is there's some really interesting under-investigated visual phenomena that's associated with black skin. So if we make the actual Roth cards for these measurements and we start using them, there's lots of really interesting research that we can then do. All right, so what about hair? I've been beating up on rendering folks. I don't actually work directly in rendering. I actually work in simulation. So I'm gonna punch myself now. This is the kind of stuff that I actually do. All right, so we don't have something as standard as uh, this one guy that we render over and over um, in hair simulation. We do have this though. All right, so this is the hairball from the Adonis system um, that came out of Columbia back in 2014. All right, this is a benchmark for whether hair, uh, the dynamics are simulated correctly. And other people have picked this up actually. So this is from the UCLA group. This is a totally different um, group. And they said, yeah, that's a pretty good test. So uh, let, let's run it on ours. Um, th this is again, just a benchmark for efficacy. Um, it's not actually 100% certain what you're looking for here. Um, and then last year, Weta Digital, the people who made Gollum, yeah, they use the same test case. So let's look at here. So we're in the same boat. It's almost to the point of a benchmark, 
but actually something's a little bit missing. All right, what is the ground truth supposed to be here? All right, so we have one potential Roth card for type one hair, but again, even like with white skin, we actually don't have a, uh, a quantitative uh, definition of what we're looking for. It's an open research problem. All right, and then the, there's the other problem. What's the right Roth card for type four hair? The whole thing, again, is wide open. Uh, I'm gonna propose something though. So again, my brilliant colleague, A.M. Dark, she pointed me to a whole bunch of type four uh, hair care videos on YouTube. And once you start looking for these, there's tons of them. They're really interesting too. You can spend all day watching these. They're really, they're fascinating. So when you have a ponytail of type one hair, it just sort of hangs down straight like this, right? Uh, that actually doesn't happen with type four hair. Uh, so really interesting things happen. So this is a YouTuber, her name is Latanya Ebony. So she pinches her hair, just like you would with a ponytail, um, but you don't get a straight ponytail. Instead, you get this really beautiful elliptical shape. So what are the dimensions of this ellipse? Under what conditions do these ellipses arise? It sure seems like we could come up with some kind of benchmark here, right? So again, if you come up with benchmarks, lots of really interesting research questions just start to pop up. All right, so that's one thing we can do, benchmark creation. We'll give it a really cool name like Roth cards and recognition of the people who did all the scholarship on this and uh, hopefully it'll take off, right? All right, so what else can we do? Well, first off, as reviewers and community members, you know, in computer graphics, we all need to agree that benchmark creation, although it sounds kind of dry, this is a 100% legit thing to actually do research on. Right? If we don't do that, we're just gonna have another decade of this sort of thing. So that is pretty dry, but the next part, hopefully, if you like science, it isn't. You get to do all the really interesting research. This is the fun part, right? So it's all worthy of investigation. The lack of models here has uh, sort of been holding us all back. Um, but now that we've actually recognized the problems, yeah, there's a, there's a high melanin skin paper that's just like waiting to be written here. Be the first one, you know, that'd be awesome. There's a type four hair simulation paper. It's just waiting to be written. Be the first one, it'll be amazing. Right, and now some more difficult things will happen. So when we're, when we're uh, doing this kind of research, we're gonna have to be on very high alert for prejudice. So we have to be on alert for our own internal prejudices. Unfortunately, there are going to be external prejudices as well. So I can, get, I can guarantee you, uh, I've been on enough of these committees. If somebody submits a technical paper on one of these topics, uh, they'll be accused of just trying to solve some narrow topic that nobody cares about. It'll be called a special case. It's too specialized for a conference of this stature. And uh, if you've done any, you know, uh, had any papers uh, that have gone under peer review, uh, you've seen this before. So somebody says, eh, I'm pretty sure existing methods handle this. And then they don't actually cite anything that, 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 uh, that says which method actually handles this. So it's a totally irrelevant thing to say. All right, this is not a narrow topic, right? So this is skin and this, this counts as skin, this counts as hair. There's like a billion people in the world that have skin and hair that looks like this. This is not a niche topic. So if someone says this in a review, you have to push back. So unfortunately, trying to publish on the topic, um, this will also trigger explicit racism. We've actually already seen this already. So nobody is dumb enough to verbalize their bias out loud. So instead they're gonna start using dog whistles. So for example, they'll say stuff like, well, acknowledging the difference in, differences in people, um, that will only increase racism. So in the name of anti-racism, I demand that we reject this paper. So people get uncomfortable when you're talking about race and they will do anything to stop talking about it. And when they make this kind of argument, uh, their purpose is to make sure that they never have to think or speak about this topic ever again. And finally, you're, we're gonna see this, right? This is goalpost moving. So, We've all been there, again, if you've ever submitted a paper. So reviewers start demanding that your work meets some super high standard that you're pretty sure that the reviewers work, the people saying this, you're pretty sure their work actually doesn't meet the standard that they're talking about. So this gets ugly, even when there's not controversial and um, uh, delicate topics like race involved. Once you throw race in the mix, it's gonna get about 10 times worse. So uh, in this case, the goal of the argument is actually not going to be to advance science. It's going to be to halt research in this direction. Again, they're saying, this makes me uncomfortable. In the name of science, I order you to stop. 
And unfortunately, people wrapping their prejudices in the mantle of science, this has a long and ugly history. Don't let it keep happening. Call it out directly. If you're in the position, say that no paper has ever met the standard that you're talking about, this paper is great and it needs to be published. All right, so if you do all that, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be accused of lowering standards. So if you've ever been on like a job search committee, um, you've heard this when you try to make sure that, for example, like the women job, job applicants are treated fairly throughout the process. Somebody always says, oh, so we're just gonna start lowering our standards. And of course, that's not what you're trying to do. It's you're trying to make sure that everyone is actually treated equally. So it can't just be you that pushes back on prejudice like this. It's not enough for one person to push back, to push back. So it has to be everybody. Everybody has to be involved in the stewardship, pushing these research problems forward. Everybody has to push back against these prejudices. In order for all of this to work, it has to involve all of us. And that's the last piece of this. We have to organize. So computer graphics is freighted with a, a racial legacy that predates the modern computer. We're part of a historical cycle that goes back over 100 years. Breaking this pattern will take more than the good intentions of a well-meaning individual. It is going to take collective action. So if you want to be part of this action, I actually have a sign-up form. Uh, Back when I gave this presentation at SIGGRAPH, um, I put the sign-up form up. The form is actually still live. So uh, we're lo still looking for people to help out with this. Um, I can cut and paste this into the chat window um, after uh, the talk is over. Um, so you can see it after I stop the screen share. Um, but if you're interested in volunteering for this, I, I suggest that you sign up. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And I'd be happy to take questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, if Rebecca Wright is around and can turn her video on, um, we can. We have a few uh, questions in the chat, but I'm not sure if Rebecca, you want to throw the first one out there while we gather some more questions. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Sure, yeah, and I mean, I think even more than I'm seeing questions in the chat, um, Ted, I'm seeing just so much. Thank you, wow, this was amazing, so eye-opening. Thank you so much. So you're getting lots of um, really exciting uh, feedback there, and hopefully you'll get some volunteers as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think one of the questions that I think about a lot is, and you touched on this at the beginning, you said, you know, so it's not, it's not just enough to say, we're just gonna have more diverse people be part of the industry or the research enterprise or whatever, and that will take care of everything. Um, yet at the same time, you know, I, I firmly believe, um, as I suspect you do as well, that we do need to have that diversity of, you know, experiences and um, skin tones and uh, ethnic backgrounds and uh, socioeconomics, you know, diversity to, so that, at the very least, we have the hope of um, people who are developing these technologies having the the the, the firsthand experience of, of what it might be like. You know, I mean, I'm 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 fairly short, and I routinely encounter things that seem to not be made for people my size. Um, and I feel like if I could have just been there in the room, I at least could have complained then, and I'd still be complaining now, perhaps. But so, you know, so how do you think about that? I mean, do you do you, like what what in what way is addressing the diversity of the workforce and um, the, you know, the people that become researchers um, going to help solve the problem? And in what ways is it, is it, you know, is it a prerequisite at all? Um, is it only a prerequisite? Yeah, yeah, I think about this a lot. Like, uh, okay, so first off, well, what you said was, um, uh, okay, so we have to hire diversely, uh, first of all, and we have to retain diversely. And yes, absolutely. It's like, uh, uh, but, um, that is not enough, that is the first step. So just thinking like, and then everything will work out. It's like, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> um, so for example, uh, um, again, I'm gonna quote my, my brilliant colleague, A.M. Dark. Um, she said, uh, okay, so if you had had a team of all black scientists back in the 90s, who were the ones developing all these skin algorithms, her, her hypothesis is 
it's uh, everything would have worked out still the exact same way because Hollywood would still have been asking for the white person generation algorithm. So even though they're all black, they all see it, right? Um, they still would be trapped in this system. They would have had to generate the exact same things. Um, so yeah, it can't just be diverse hiring. Um, it has to be that we all think more carefully about, you know, exactly what problems that we're working on, the solutions that we're working on, what assumptions it encodes. And when we see something insidious happen, we have to think harder and we have to push back on it. Yeah, thank you. I think related to that, we have a question in the chat from Sarah Morrison Smith, who is a Roman fellow in computer science at Barnard. Um, she says, thank you for the excellent talk. Um, do you think there's a link between the type of people we can accurately animate and the type of people we see in animated films? In other words, do you think that we are seeing fewer black protagonists because we can't accurately animate them? Uh, 100% absolutely. Um, so for example, uh, okay, so I, I used to work at Pixar and I still talk to a lot of people there. And actually they, um, they just had a panel at SIGGRAPH or a major conference. And they talked about all the challenges of lighting uh, the black characters in Soul, um, the, the the movie that won Best Picture last year, and it's just outside of the norms of what they usually do. So they had to like develop all new techniques. They had to like bring in actual black cinematographers from live action film to teach them how to do the lighting. Um, and not only that, but uh, so okay. So what you get is the defaults in the software, um, the stuff that's really easy to do it's a very specific type of person. So if you wanna do something that's outside of those defaults, it is literally more expensive. It will take you more time. And as far as a movie, uh, a movie producer is concerned, it will cost more money. Um, so another thing that happens, um, uh, my colleague uh, Mara McMahon actually, who works at Pixar, uh, she pointed out like, if you wanna model disability, everything that uh, we use to animate is based on symmetry. So it's like this left, right bilateral symmetry. So if you actually want to have handicapped um, uh, disabilities actually modeled, it will what's called break the rig. It will be very expensive to animate that, even though, you know, we all know from everyday life, it's like, yeah, everyone does not, you know, like uh, move symmetrically like an Olympic athlete. You know, everyone is, is actually very asymmetric, but it's really expensive to animate that. So you see a lot less of it in film. Yeah, I mean, I have also just an interdisciplinary question. This reminds me so much of studying architecture, which I initially did, and then having to study art historical methods. And it just strikes me in your presentation how interdisciplinary it is. You talk about art history, you talk about film, and I'm curious about what your thoughts are on computer graphics curriculum or computer science curriculum as it relates to studying computer graphics. Do you think that as it is, it can adhere to kind of the interest that you've brought to the fore in this presentation, or do you do you propose that it should be reimagined? Um, I do think the teaching needs to be rethought quite a bit. Um, so uh, for example, I was even looking at like all the textbooks that were out there and like you look at all the computer graphics textbooks and um, they're all written by white people. <laughs> so like, go find a computer graphics textbook that has a, a person of color on the author list. We found one. Um, so, you know, imagine how this shows up, you know, reflected in the, um, you know, uh, in the actual content itself. Um, uh, uh, we actually, I actually did do a little digging on this and um, I'm trying to remember what my conclusion here was. Um, oh. Okay, so uh, the, the way that it's very Eurocentric and US centric. Um, so uh, back in the 90s, there was a, an algorithm called the radiosity algorithm. It was simultaneously discovered by people at Cornell and it was actually simultaneously discovered by people at Hiroshima University in Japan. And you know, if you look at like the textbooks from the 90s, everyone is very careful to mention this. It was like, this was simultaneously discovered in both the East and the West. And then as you march forward in time, the East just gets erased. So, you know, it is just the white people writing the books and then people just forget, you know, it's like, oh yeah, so it was from Cornell, right? And Cornell is where I went, you know? So it's like, uh, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm so happy to see Cornell. Wait a minute, where'd the Hiroshima reference go? Um, so yeah, I, I think we need to think a little harder about how we, how we do teaching. I think some reimagining is gonna be needed. And then the last question um, is from our post back, Zoe Webmack, and she's, 
asking if computer graphics were a digital painting without the quantitative algorithms, do you think the same issues in representing slash understanding human features would be similar or different? Wondering how much racist practices and computer graphics are inherited from using algorithm as a medium or science as a ju justification. It's very interesting. Um, well, I mean, I showed the Vermeer paintings, right? So it's like, yeah, so we're also informed by the Western art history tradition as well. So even if it was that, um, yeah, the computer was just this jacked up like painting, you know, painting easel or something like that. Would we still see the same problems? It would be like, ah, uh, not exactly the same, but if we if we just sort of like went with the flow again of like, yeah, this this feels right um, and develop algorithms that way, I'm pretty sure that in 20 years, we'd find ourselves in a different but equally uncomfortable position. <laughs>